Hello everybody, Andrew here. Uh, just a quick note before you listen to this podcast uh, with Richard Noble. Um, he is a wonderful talker, he's a wonderful character, and he talks us through the entire history of his land speed record-breaking career from the original thrust right through to um, Bloodhound SSC going into administration. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is because of this coronavirus, he had to be on the other end of a telephone line, which it is fair to say at one or two points throughout the broadcast is not at quite the quality that we would like. Hopefully you will understand this. Hopefully you will think it was um, worth it. Um, anyway, enjoy the next hour and we will see you for the next one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special Drive Nation podcast. I am Andrew Frankel. Why special? Because sitting opposite me, in a very far from literal sense, you'll be glad to know, is not my usual partner in Drive Nation, Dan Prosser, but none other than Richard Noble, OBE, one of just three people alive in the world today to have broken the land speed record. The man who took that record back from the Americans after a break of nearly 20 years, the man who drove thrust to 633 miles per hour back in 1983, the leader of the team that broke the sound barrier in 1997 with thrust SSC, and the man who toiled for over a decade to bring what was then known as the Bloodhound SSC project to fruition. So before we get going, please remember to rate, review and subscribe to the Drive Nation podcast wherever you happen to be listening to it. It really helps us and means we will be able to do many more in future. Uh, Richard is here today because he has a new book out, simply called Take Risk! Exclamation mark, published by <laughs> Evro and available everywhere that you would expect. It's not an autobiography as such, but it is, as the cover describes, the amazing story of the people who made Richard's, Richard Noble's extreme projects on land, at sea and in the air possible. Now, today we're going to be concentrating somewhat on the landbound side of things, but if you're interested in Richard's other projects in fields from light aircraft to a powerboat designed to break the record for crossing the Atlantic, as well as the land speed record, it is very much well worth a read. Richard, welcome. I, I can't imagine a man with your relentless enthusiasm and energy coping too well with lockdown. How are you getting on? Oh, it's, it's a good time, Andrew. It's a really good time, actually. It's, uh, it's very peaceful, plenty of time to read and, um, and dream up new ideas, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm pleased. Um, you won't remember this, Richard, but uh, when I was a youngster about 30 years ago and I was working at Autocar's office in Teddington, uh, we used to come round to your place and, watch, and you'd show us old cine films of, of land speed record breaking. And I think that's then, you know, when I first picked up on your absolute passion for, for that particular pursuit. What, can you just tell us what it was about speed and the land speed record in particular, which really sort of got you up in the morning? Well, it's, it's a fantastic subject. I mean, it really is a fantastic subject because, of course, what you're doing is you're producing a, a vehicle which is going to go faster than any other vehicle in the world. Um, you've got a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to innovate. Uh, you've got your right out on your own. You're funded by your sponsors. So you can run the ideal project without having too much sort of third-party intrusion. And um, it's unlimited racing it's uh, you know it's just really what as far as the mind will take you and of course part of it is fascinating you've got to drive the car like a effectively like like a test pilot you've got to drive a graph and then also um the business side is amazing you know putting the actual deals together and um uh, be going it's it's, uh, it's a fascinating subject and, and do you think there is something of the sort of the pioneering sp uh, spirit about it too, the, the, the sort of thing that made people want to go to the poles and climb mountains and, and, and do that sort of thing? Is, is, is there an element of that in there as well? Yeah, absolutely, because what you're doing is you're pushing the boundaries of science. I mean, when we broke the sand barrier, I mean, we, we had terrible trouble from, from Britain. A number of people who said, you know, this was an expensive way of killing the driver. And uh, the <laughs> negativity was, was absolutely extraordinary. But due to one man, Ron Ayres, um, we were able to prove that the aerodynamics were going to work. And um, the car, in the end, made five timed supersonic passes and a sixth of which wasn't timed. So uh, we did actually produce a re reliable supersonic vehicle. Wow. So we, we will come on to that, obviously, um, later on. But for now, can we go right back to the beginning? I, I noticed in your book... Um, your first land speed car, if, if we can call it that, was called Thrust One. Uh, and, and, yeah. and I'm interested in the one. Did you call it Thrust One at the time or was it just called Thrust? I mean, if you called it Thrust One, did you already anticipate there being a Thrust Two? Oh, yes, it's part of the programme. I mean, basically, when I started the whole thing, um, we got to start from somewhere. Um, 
as a team, we had absolutely no uh, no experience, no engineering talent, <laughs> nothing. So uh, it was really very simple. I got I was lucky enough truck chassis. Uh, we put it on four wheels, and uh, we put a, a Derwent Eight Gen engine on it, um, and became experience with it. And it was very very valuable. I mean, we did end up with a spec, but it was I learned so much from that. It was well worth doing. And of course, it was thrust one because the next to be thrust two. Thrust two is always going to be a, a demonstration vehicle, hence the. But of course, later on, we then discovered that thrust two is capable of getting the world land speed record, so we could shorten the process. Uh, I see. And, and, and can you just talk us through what happened um, in, in your in, in your final run in, in the original Thrust One? Oh yeah. Well, basically, we were at RAF Fairford. We got real problems in trying to get uh, uh, an opportunity to run on a decent runway somewhere. And at long last, the civil servant said, "Yes, we could have one day at Fairford because they were going to um, they were going to resurface the runway the next day." So if there was an accident or anything, <laughs> that would be taken care of. The runway damage would be taken care of. Yeah, and um, we got a good run down the runway at, uh, I suppose, 120-odd miles an hour, something like that. I uh, turned it around. We gave it a lot more power. And I don't know what happened, but something happened, and the car just just flipped up in the air. We had a triple airborne roll, and uh, it ended up upside down in the middle of the runway. Uh, and, and, and you without a mark on you? I was all right, yes. I, I was, in some way, I was quite pleased in a sort of perverse way, Andrew, <laughs> Andrew because I, um, I I shut the engine down when I was upside down. <laughs> so I was still feeling thinking logically. Um, and, and, and being upside down at 200 miles an hour in, in your first ever land speed car didn't in any way put you off? No, no, no. We did the, the most sensible thing after an accident like that, which is to go to the pub. <laughs> and then um, from the pub to the scrapyard. And we pushed off the remains of Thrust 1 for 175 quid, and that kept us solvent. And we moved on to Thrust 2. So, so can you just talk me through a little bit about how Thrust 2 came into being? Because it, it occurred to me that you would have needed to convince, you know, not just business people to give you the money, but also engineers to build you the car. What was it, do you think, that they saw in that project, um, which, you know, gave it the credibility to make them want to come on board and, and, and do this extraordinary thing? Well, there were two things. I mean, certainly the, uh, the, the, the element that gave them the most credibility was John Aykroyd. Uh, John is an absolutely brilliant designer. And uh, John um, decided this is what he really wanted to do. And being a very strong-minded and driving individual, he, uh, he set about it. And so uh, anybody investigating the project would end up talking with John and realizing that he knew exactly what, what he was talking about. And of course, the other thing was, too, that the keep the project moving ahead all the time. So people realized that you know, it was beginning to create mass, small chance that we would at the end of it, and hopefully at the end of it, a world record. And, and, and why did you decide to go with a jet? I mean, the land speed record that you were um, trying to break was that set by Gary Gabalich uh, in a rocket car in, in 1970. But you decided not to do that. You decided to go with a sort of more traditional means of, uh, of breaking the land speed record. Uh, Andrew, it was a better means, <laughs> frankly. The problem with the jets, with the rockets, is that you uh, end up with a very, very heavy vehicle. And it, of course, consumes its fuel at a hell of a rate. And um, if you're not careful and you've got the figures wrong, you will end up at high speed with a very lightweight vehicle, which is, which is just, just downright dangerous. Um, it's a very high risk. The one thing about the jet cars, of course, is that uh, you've got a big thumping heavy jet engine in the middle of it, and that gives you the weight. And that weight, of course, is still there when the car is going fast. Uh, the second thing was we knew, we knew that we got to run the car at air shows and also on one or two um, racetracks, which was really interesting, um, to demonstrate it. We've got to build up a huge public following for it. You can't do that with a rocket-powered vehicle. Ah, uh, OK. OK, so let us spool forward. It's, it's 1981, um, and you arrive at Bonneville. Um, what was the fastest you'd, you'd driven a car up until that point? Uh, let's just think. Um, yes, I'd driven thrust 200-odd miles an hour. So, um, and I'd driven a car probably about 120, something like that. 
Yeah. But um, we've done a lot of dem- de- demonstration work on UK runways during 1980, and this really paid off uh, because it taught us how to run the car, it taught us how to look after the car, how to drive the car, how to maintain it, and it gave us a uh, tremendous sort of confidence. And um, we, we managed to plug into the air um, circuit. So every weekend we were out at another, another runway somewhere uh, running the car in front of the public. That was good. Yeah, but it's not um, it's not Bonneville, is it, in terms of um, the speeds that you can get to? I mean, what what was it like when you first started pushing on to, you know, there, there, there are quite a few of us who have, you know, myself included, who have driven a car at 200 miles an hour. But uh, I, you are you and Andy are the only people I ever kn- I, I know who have driven a car at, at, at anything substantially more than that. So, so what does it feel like um, when you sort of push on through three, four, five hundred miles an hour for the first time? Is, is, is it the complete void into the unknown? It sounds like. Um, basically, it was a really horrible experience. And the fundamental thing was that uh, as an organization, uh, uh, the Thrust 2 team, we were pretty confident. We were pretty good. We could, we'd could. we spent the, the, the last summer zapping the car up to 250, 260. We held the, world, the British land speed record. Um, and we were very confident of the car and its abilities. So we then put it on the salt, on the Bonneville salt flats, with its solid aluminum wheels. And they didn't work. And it's the most appalling situation. You're sitting there one moment with a great grin on your face because you've actually got there. Uh, you open up the throttle and the steering appears to have no effect whatsoever. And you're drifting all over the place. And it is, you're just beginning to wonder how the hell we're actually going to sort this thing out. Mm-hmm. And so in the first run at 95 miles an hour, we went sideways and then later on to 175 miles an hour. The car turned right and we went one and a bit miles into the desert. Um, and at one stage, the timekeepers got very upset because the car was out of line and pointing at them. <laughs> so uh, it yeah. wasn't fun at all. And um, gradually, we began to get the, part, the speeds up. And um, we still, as a team, didn't know how to drive the car. And I was, I was very cautious, very, very cautious, because I thought that the car was going to go sideways at any time. And the, the problem with, um, the, with Bonneville is that these high speeds, if a car goes sideways, it flies, because you get an oblique airflow over the, over the top of the car, you get low pressure, and it kind of hoovers it up into the air, and then, then you really have a mother and father of an accident. So we were sort of pushing on like this. I took John Aykroyd for a run, put him in the other cockpit, and we drove up to 400 miles an hour. Uh, John wasn't very pleased after that. He said he'd never do it again. Um, and then one day we, uh, we, we, were, we were having problems because basically I was windy about using reheat, the afterburner on the car, because I felt that, you know, if the car wasn't actually stable, you're going to add a whole lot of po- bunch of power to the car. You know, it was going to, it was, something awful was going to happen. Anyhow, we did one run um, down the track and uh, we got to the far end. And this was the first time we were going to do a turn run, which is a team thing. You've got to turn the car around and send it back um, so that it's out of the measured mile within the one hour of actually going into the measured mile. And everything went wrong. I mean, absolutely everything went wrong. And the uh, the car ended up there. That's right. The fuel visor broke its prop shaft. Uh, the car was being towed by the accountant, which should never happen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyhow, we made a real mess of it. And what happened then was that um, I was just simply so angry at our incompetence that um, well, as soon as I got away, I banged the car into reheat. And surprise, surprise, it's stable as hell. Wow. And w- this was the secret. The secret was that you've got to accelerate hard and decelerate hard, and you're all right. If you try and cruise it, you're going to be in trouble. Wow. And so we zapped up the track, and um, we got up to... Uh, I think just under 500 miles an hour. And then something happened. We were, we were running on a very rough salt and um, a battery connector um, came, on, came loose. We lost our fuel pressure. The engine started to wind down and um, basically we didn't get a 500 mile an hour average. We got a 447 mile an hour average. Got it back to base. Um, we're now very happy because we knew we could do this now. And then it rained and Bonneville was flooded. <laughs> and, and that was the end of 1981? That was the end of 81. And then we had a terrible trouble with the insurance company. I mean, absolutely unbelievable. And um, 
So what had happened was I'd insured the desert against rain at 75 to 1 with our last 1,000 quid. <laughs> and, and so there we are. We were, we'd got a BBC program with all the water all over the place, etc. And the insurance company said uh, uh, they, they, they were going to appoint an assessor. So I said, great, who pays the assessor? And they said they did. So I became very suspicious. And um, we had a meeting with the sponsors. And uh, they were all, like, it was like a wake, all these long faces, you know, how on earth are we going to get back again, etc. And I explained that we would um, decided on a press conference uh, in about 10 days' time, and the insurance man was very upset over this. He felt he should have been told. And, uh, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, it's very simple. Um, we're either going to um, uh, praise your insurance company to the skies if you pay up, and if you don't pay up, then we're going to have to um, circulate your policy amongst the media. And that's a terrible <laughs> sign. The man made the classic mistake of saying, you wouldn't dare. I said, yes, you bloody would. <laughs> and uh, nobody knew what was going to happen. But on the day, there was a great turn up of media. Everyone was really interested. And our insurance director turned up with a leather, uh, a leather wallet and a check for 75000 Wow. Bloody marvellous. So we were able to keep going. Yeah. And, the, and, and then, then you got wet again in 82. Yes, indeed. And this time uh, we went out and, uh, and, of course, that was the time we, we found the Black Rock Desert and um, we battled on. Of course, we couldn't go back to Britain again if we'd gone out, to the, gone out and found Bonneville flooded when, as soon as we arrived. Um, and we found the Black Rock Desert, much better place to run, had enormous problems with the environmentalists, but eventually the, uh, uh, they're back down. And we got the car into the 600s, which was terrific. But it was too late in the year, and the weather was about to break, and we would have to come back again in 83. So, and uh, the sponsors had insured again <laughs> against the weather, so they, uh, they cleaned up that time, and we were able to go back in 83. So just before we get on to 83, which is obviously the year, um, <clears throat> I think everybody listening to this will have experienced um, travelling at 600 miles an hour and not being very bothered about it because they're at 40,000 feet in a jumbo jet. I think we've yep. all also travelled at 60 miles an hour um, and been very frightened by it because maybe we've been in a narrow country lane or, or whatever. So I'm just, could you just try to explain what driving a car at 600 miles an hour feels like um does it feel unbelievably fast is it, is it frightening what, what, what's sort of going through your mind well let's just uh understand it um basically the thing about the land speed record is that you've got to get rid of the most dangerous element of all which is emotion um you really have to uh, drive like an autom automaton you've got to put all your worries and concerns and fear behind you um, and you've got it's a cold blooded business. You're part of a team and you're not going to let them down. Um, and so uh, you're not looking for any you know, one of the most dangerous things of all is to have a driver who's getting a thrill out of it. That is really dangerous because uh, the driver will uh, continue to um, drive faster and faster and, uh, and get more thrill. He gets a driver out of it. And, of course, then, uh, you know, you will have an accident sooner or later. And that's, that's really out. And, and, you, and you were able to do that. You were able to be um, process driven and dispassionate about the business of actually being in the oh, car. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because really, at the middle range speeds, um, you know, you, you're like a taxi driver. You're going out first thing in the morning. You're going to drive at 600 miles an hour about lunchtime. And uh, you're going to finish at the end of the day. And uh, we managed to get the car so reliable and so safe. Uh, it became boring. <laughs> I mean, what you were, you know, seriously, it's just, you know, you're out and doing the same thing again and again and trying to get a few more miles an hour out of it. But the interesting thing is that when you start getting into the 600s, it starts to get really exciting now because you're approaching the speed of sound. It's not supersonic, of course, but you're approaching the speed of sound and um, you can see the shock waves on the car, particularly on top of the, of the engine intake and also on top of the wheel arches. That comes up at about 617 miles an hour. Wow. And it's going 1.5 times the speed of sound across the top of the cockpit. And that is fascinating. The other thing, too, is that I've been doing it a long, long time. Um, you know, all these years. And so you've built up an enormous sort of experience, I suppose is the best way of describing it. And um, your mental processes speed right up. 
And so everything happens at slow motion. So it's a very relaxed sort of country drive, really. And you can see all the details on the track come up and go under the car. It's over 600 miles an hour. Uh, the it's scary that is at the end of it is when you come out of the measured mile. Remember, you hope you're coming out of the measured mile faster than you've never been before. And um, then you've got to start throttling back. And when you throttle back, throttle back on the, the engine, cut the afterburner, throttle back gently on the engine, you're never quite sure where the car is going to swap ends. And if it does swap ends, that's the end of everything. Gosh. But um, John was, Aykroyd was very clever, and he came up with the idea of the two tail fins. So the car has two tail fins. Yes. And those two tail fins kept it straight, and they started working at about 300 miles an hour. And from 300 up to its peak speed of 650, they kept the car straight, which is really good. It's a very, very clever and original idea. But am, am I right in saying that um, when you did actually break the land speed record and, and you actually did, I know you peaked at, I mean, the record was at 6.33, but you actually peaked at 6.50. Was that actually sort of beyond the technical design capabilities or the limitations of the car? Were you absolutely at 100 and something percent? Yeah, we were. We designed the car for, eight, for 650. And we got 650.88. That's highly <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> that was a great job done by John Ackroyd. I mean, and the, and the engine team is really brilliant. Um, so there you are, land speed record holder. Um, and then you have this idea of, of breaking the sound barrier. Um, a few Much years later ago. on, we did airplanes first. And yes, then, indeed. Uh, and then the ship, yeah. Um, but um, although you were unquestionably the first team to break the land speed record at a speed that was higher than the speed of sound, you weren't the first team, were you, to claim to have gone faster than the speed of sound? Could you just give yeah, me... Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is the story, which was the Budweiser rocket. And there was um, a lot of money and uh, floating around in the middle of this deal. So there were a lot of people very seriously involved in it. And uh, they claimed to have broken the sound barrier in 1979. And um, it was mighty impressive. It was a very long, very long thin, pencil-like rocket. A very brave guy inside. And um, basically, uh, they, they went out, but they, they hadn't got adequate timing. Their, their timing, believe it or not, was simply a man with a, with, with a radar scanner who was trying to follow the car. And he got confused with a water truck. So that didn't uh, The car also had this big rocket problem, which it kept running out of fuel. And so therefore, they couldn't actually get it across a measured mile at speed because it was, you know, at those sort of speeds, you're decelerating violently if you haven't got the engine on. So they reduced the distance um, from one mile to 52.8 feet. Um, and they thought that was best, but then they had a real problem because they didn't know where to put the 52.8 feet. Um, and um, the interesting thing was that it clearly went um, somewhere around, probably around 690, 700 miles an hour. And um, because it got a shockwave under its under its tail, and that lifted the wheels off the ground, and that gave the wow. driver a one hell of a fright. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, you know, after, you know, many, I suppose it was about a year or two years later, we were having a talk about all this. No, that's right. It was about 19, after I got the record, so that was 1983. And we were talking about all this. Uh, Sam Barrett was the driver, and Sam was saying, well, you've got a world record and I've got nothing. And I said, Stan, it's simple. You get back into it and you go and do it again and have it properly timed. You know, that's what we've been doing. We've been running our car up and down the desert time after time after time, not just one run, but the regular runs. Uh, to um, to actually prove that we've got the record and have it independently timed, but they wouldn't do it. They, they wouldn't. wouldn't do it. So that was the end of that. So was there any? I mean, sonic boom or or any other evidence other than? No, they had no sonic boom. There's um, there's and there's a lot of uh, a lot of detail about this, and there's a lot of controversy. And uh, eventually, what happened was that the Blue Flame team managed to convince the U.S. government. Uh, that the car, that it hadn't gone supersonic. And the U.S. government had already said that it had gone supersonic. The U.S. government then uh, went backwards and said, uh, no, they couldn't prove that it had gone supersonic. And that was that. Ah, uh, okay, okay. 
so that was that so um but then can we now move on to um thrust ssc um mm. an astonishing um project really uh, a, a project which in the end ended up raising the land speed record by a greater margin than any previous car in history it had to yeah um it, it had to do that to to to, to go supersonic yeah. um so it was obviously so there was what 14 years between um thrust 2 and thrust ssc yeah. breaking the land speed records um when did thrust ssc start to sort of come together in your mind uh, really about 1990, 1992. I can't remember the exact date, but uh, what happened was um, I was out on um, Bonneville with my very old friend, Art Arfons, who was just just amazingly talented guy. And Art decided what he was going to do, that the future of land speed records was going to be small cars, like um, uh, uh, really like a Christmas house. And he built number 27, and he was going out to run that, so we all went out to run it. But um, it didn't work out too well for him, and he, he kind of stopped at that point. And Craig Breedlove was there, and the three of us were having a, having a talk, and Craig said, I want you to know that um, I've decided I'm going to continue. I'm building a new car. I've, I'm committed. I've bought the engines. And um, so I said, well, okay, Craig, you were first over 400, 500, 600, so it's got to be 700 and supersonic, to which he said, yes, it was. Wow. So uh, then I came back to Britain, and remember that uh, basically that um, we had no team, no resource, nothing. And uh, all sorts of people started ringing me up. And they said, uh, there's something big going on, Richard, um, but we've all signed non-disclosure agreements. And so therefore, we can't tell you what it is. But you better look out. You know, there's something going on. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But um, I don't know. I was very busy doing whatever I was doing. And uh, I never really paid too much attention to it. And then the... Um, McLaren Formula One team rang up and said uh, they got an in, they got a show with some sponsors and they'd like to uh, have some footage of Thrust Two. So uh, I, I, I immediately realised that this is probably what it was. So I said, "Yes, of course, I'll send you a tape," but I didn't. And then they rang up about a week later and they said it hadn't arrived. And I said, "Oh dear, the post is terrible these days." <laughs> so and I'll send you another one, and I didn't. And they rang up another week later, and they were really angry at this point. <laughs> so that's the point we knew that they were going to have a go, and they were producing um, a car called the Maverick. And um, so um, this was great. It was going to be a three-horse race, which was terrific, because this is what we all need. You know, we all need a good old fight. And, um, and, and so, I'm, Richard, sorry, were the Australians involved at that stage as well? They were coming along up the back. Um, up, 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 uh, really, up, up, up. they were traveling, coming along. They'd, um, they, in the meantime, they produced a thrust two like car, and they got up to six hundred odd miles an hour, which was great. It was a great achievement, but um, they hadn't managed to get any records at that stage. Uh, and of course, they then moved on to the rocket program, uh, which is what they're involved in at the moment. And um, with the luck, hopefully, it'll be successful. <laughs> Yeah, so, so so back to the three-horse race. But in the end, only one of the horses ended up turning up um, in the desert. Yeah, well, that's it. Um, basically, the, uh, the, um, the McLaren people gave up. And uh, so it was a real shame because, um, you know, there's nothing like a bit of competition. Um, they sort of gave up. Um, and then Breedlove, basically, um, we then discovered with Breedlove, is that there wasn't a computer in the place. Um he was designing the car as he thought it should be. So in other words, he was doing exactly what he'd been so successful um, uh, before at, uh, um, in Bonneville and the, with the land speed record, designing his own cars and doing his own calcs. In this case, we were lucky enough to have Ron Ayres, and Ron basically uh, took, us, uh, uh, took us through all this. We did computational flow dynamics. Uh, then that had to be proven. We proved it with rocket tests with rocket testing, which was highly spectacular. And um, eventually we ended up with a situation where we had, um, um, you know, we had a really credible project. And um, Ron was the, really the, the thing, the person that held the whole project together because effectively we were all backing Ron. I mean, Andy was backing Ron by driving the car. I was backing Ron by making the money. And everybody else was backing Ron by, by completing the car and running it. Yeah. 
<laughs> so Ron was the most important person in the whole team. Um, so the, the car itself, however, had was was um, somewhat unconventional by um, land speed records um, standards. It had not one but two Rolls Royce Spey jet engines and um, yep. rear wheel steering as well, which I, which I understand caused your your your, your dry, a few grey hairs to appear on your on your driver's oh, head. Oh, it certainly did, and Andy Andy conquered that one in the end. But no, the difficulty was that um, uh, when we were into the sort of preliminary design of the car we realized we couldn't steer the front wheels. Uh, the fundamental problem was we got to get those engines as low as we could, and there wasn't sort of, there wasn't space for a wheel to be steered, in other words, to be turned left and turned right. Uh, otherwise, we were going to increase the cross-sectional area of the car, and it wasn't going to go supersonic. And also, Glenn Barsha, who did all the, the wheels and the steering and everything else, was really worried about, um, uh, about uh, um, progression. In other words, what can actually happen with this is that, um, uh, you know, by moving the wheel slightly, you can get a force which will, will lift that wheel off the ground. So, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we got some real worries there. Um, the solution uh, Glenn came up with was the rear wheel steer. And um, this we, uh, he proved by taking his brother-in-law's old mini and sticking up a sticking out a structure on the back of the car um, uh, so that it had the same plan form as the, the supersonic car and was steered by its wheels. And actually, it was quite comfortable to drive. It was quite good. Uh, so we started to get a little bit more confident. But um, that was the only way in which we could have done it. Um, and, 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 and let's talk about, um, about, uh, about Andy now. I, mean, I guess the first question is... Um, Having been the first man to drive up 650 miles an hour, having broken your land speed record, um, why why were you not going to drive this car? And then having decided not to drive it yourself, how did you go about finding Andy? Okay, well, basically what was actually happening was that um, once we'd completed the um, the research and we'd done the rocket testing and we got all the data and everything, I was very excited. I mean, I really was. And I thought, this is it. We're going to be able to do this. And it was a time, Andrew, when all those big companies were telling the world and uh, shareholders and customers how important they were and how, how brave they were and innovative they were, etc. Of course, this was all rubbish. <laughs> because as soon as I started going around the boards with all the documentation and uh, all the research data, etc., they were absolutely terrified of it. And it was quite clear we were we were just not going to get the money. It was really simple. I had the thought that you know holding the land speed record and everything else, people would just just absolutely line up to join this thing, but not a bit of it. So now we've got an enormous problem. The problem was simply that we had um, some very valuable results. Um, we were capable of we we believed we were well capable of doing that. And something had to give. And um, I'd also had a certain amount of worry about from my, my family, who were a bit worried about my my existence. <laughs> <laughs> and um, really, and I thought, well, the simple answer to this is not to drive. Find somebody better than me to drive. And um, that means that I can concentrate totally on the funding and getting, getting this thing done. And what, was, so, it, was, was, was that a, a bit of a wrench for you? Were you bitterly disappointed? It's a terrible wrench, yeah. It really is, because I really enjoyed driving thrust too. And, uh, you know, and I like to think I was quite good at it. Um, but, and, you know, and this was the next big stage, and, you know, it was a huge leap forward. Um, but, um, you know, you've got to be realistic. Um, you've got to somehow get this thing through and get it done. And, of course, this is one of the features of the book which is simply that we have a terrible problem in Britain, that um, basically we, we're, we're not good on innovation, we're not good on risk-taking. And, of course, uh, you know, we were just faced with just awful difficulties with the project all the way down the line. But, um, no, Andy did really well. Um, it couldn't have been done without Andy. I mean, he was just terrific. He was a very, very quiet bloke, um, uh, except in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> And um, very, very serious, and he solved the problem of driving it because he felt very strongly that any wheel, in, any steering input he had to put in had to be of a certain way. Otherwise, uh, the car might fishtail and get away from him. And that, which was great, but it was a hell of a drive. 
And one day I was flying a plane down the um, down the course, and I did, uh, you know, and I was I don't know, I was flying like 150 miles an hour or something, and the and you suddenly realised that the the tracks of, of thrust as the sea were just absolutely zigzag all the way up. He put it all right the way up. He seemed quite happy once it went supersonic. He said it was a bit of a pussycat once it was supersonic, but subsonic was a bit of a handful. Yes, yeah, so, I, mean, I, I should say to people listening to this, if you, if you haven't been onto YouTube and watched the in-car of Andy putting in a 90-degree steering angle at over 700 <laughs> miles an hour, um, it, 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 you know, talk about calm under pressure. But um, yeah. you know, so so Andy Andy Green. I mean, obviously RAF um, test pilot. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough to meet him a few times. I mean, he, is he really as cool in private as he appears in public? Because I mean, he's just in an, on another world compared to most people you meet. He, he, he's a very he's a very amazing guy, Andy. First class honours in mathematics, um, and um, and when he decides he's going to do something, he stays with it. So he stayed with Bloodhound all the way. Through the the uh, the difficulties, terrible time of trying to put it all together, um, and um, his only comment with thrust SOC was that after we got the record, he said he he thought we'd driven the car twice too often. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing, and, and and the car ran pretty much trouble free from from what I recall. I, mean, I know he has a fairly hairy. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Or, I mean, you know, with a with a car as complex as that, you're always running against problems. Uh, the great fun was the Americans, because when we arrived there, um, when the Americans took a look at the car, it was known as the binoculars, <laughs> for obvious <laughs> reasons. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, and the railroad steering, of course, gave us a lot of problems, particularly in Jordan, and, to, and uh, also the wheel design, so there was a lot of work that had to be done on that. We had problems with the active ride um, in the desert, and it was it was uh, Jerry Bliss's active ride, which actually... Uh, enabled us to get the rock, get the sorry record because the back of the car was gradually raised as the Mach number increases, increased and it kept the car on the ground. So with these cars, of course, because the down forces are um, proportional to the square of the speed and even more so when they're supersonic, um, you've got to design these cars so they are skimmers. So they skim across the surface and so the loading on the wheels is the same when it's stationary as when it's supersonic. Gosh. Hello, Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear oh, you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so you, sorry. So anybody listening to this will now have long realised we're actually at different ends of a not terribly good telephone line. But we will, right. we, we 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 will persevere. Um, so, what was that moment like? I mean, you would presumably have heard it before you saw it when uh, you heard that boom and you realised that for the first time in history, a a land bound car with with a, with a man inside it had broken the speed of sound. There's something funny about sonic booms that we learned that they're not sort of really sort of predictable. So the first people to hear the sonic bang um, on one of the earlier test runs was the Americans. So we had a great cluster of, of several hundred Americans who lived in their camper trucks up on the hills, um, basically watching all this and, and uh, monitoring all the, the, the radio transmissions. And they heard the bangs, but we didn't. And then eventually, when we started getting um, truly supersonic, um, then, of course, we were getting these enormous bangs. And to give an idea, the bangs could be heard 40 miles away. Wow. And they were rocking houses uh, <laughs> and buildings in the village of Gerlach, which was 15 miles away. <laughs> and, um, you know, in the school, basically, it, it rocked the school. And the covers on the sprinklers fell off in the classrooms. So this is proper motor racing, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> but in but in the car, presumably the moment you actually go through the sound barrier, do, 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 things, do things get very sort of calm then, or is, is there any sensation, or is it just an, another number there's, on the dial? There's no sensation. It's just an, an, another number on the dial. It's like a boat going down a canal, really, and you know, so you've got a wave, um, um, a V-shaped wave at the front and a V-shaped wave at the back, and basically when it comes past you, you get this high pressure bang from the front wave and another one from the from the, um, the the trailing wave. So you'll get the typical bang bang and what the Americans always call bar boom. Uh, okay. Wow. And so and, and, and so that was that. Um, I think for most people you'd think that with that land speed record, um, the sound barrier in the bag and everything you'd achieve with um, thrust two that that might be enough land speed record breaking for a lifetime. But 
10 years later, you decided to go and have um, a, a, another crack at it. So we're obviously now starting on the story of what was at the time known as Bloodhound SSC. Um, and it was a very, very long, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing your toughest um, land speed record project of, of all, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. Um, again, we, were, we all hoped that, uh, you know, we'd get proper support for it and proper help and proper advice. A lot of people, and there were some 300 companies who helped us. Um, but um, the money was always the problem. It was an absolute bloody nightmare. And um, the end of it, uh, one of the team members, Connor, said, uh, you know, Richard, do you realize you've been at war for 11 years? Gosh. <laughs> I thought that summed it up really rather well. So those 11 years started, I believe, in a pub in Whitehall. Um, That's right. And a conversation between you and Andy. Um, who, who opened the bidding? Did you say to him, um, how about it, or, or was it the other way around? Well, basically, we were up against Steve Fossett. And Steve was uh, the late and great Steve Fossett. He was just an amazing guy. He could achieve anything. He, he made an enormous amount of money, so finance wasn't a problem. And he was also a very, very capable guy. And, of course, he had solo ballooned um, around the world. He'd flown an airplane one and a half times around the world. I mean, there's nothing this guy couldn't do. And um, it was quite clear that this re that Steve represented a really tremendous threat to the Thrust SSC record. And, um, you know, when you've done one of these things... Um, there's always a sort of hankering for having another go, you know, because <laughs> the teamwork and the uh, the technology and the inventiveness and so on is, is just great. And uh, so Andy and I met in the pub and said, what the hell are we going to do about it? And we threatened we do it. We reckon that uh, Fawcett would do 800 odd miles an hour. So we decided that uh, what we better do is take him on. And uh, we were talking initially about Mach 1.5, one and a half times the speed of sound. So the next meeting was with Ron Ayers, and Ron was absolutely horrified. <laughs> However, a bit of horse trading went on, and eventually we ended up with Mach 1.4, uh, the size mile in our car. And uh, so then we sort of set about it. And, of course, we got no idea how to do this, and not only in terms of the engineering, but also in terms of the, uh, and in terms of the finance and putting a program together like this. I mean, this car would... Uh, uh, outperform any jet fighter at low level. And, and, and so also, you, presumably, you, you'd also run up against a very hard um, geographical problem, namely finding somewhere that you could actually run it, because I'm guessing for those sorts of speeds, neither Bonneville nor Blackrock would have been um, w w would have got the job done. No, we couldn't do it on, on Bonneville, because, of course, using solid wheels, and that just wouldn't work. And you can only get about 11 miles on Bonneville. But... Um, BlackRock was brilliant, the right surface and at least 13 miles of track. Absolutely great. But unfortunately, um, we hadn't allowed for the Burning Man program. And these guys bring in about 70 or 80,000 Americans who run around painted different colors and most of them starkers in the sun for a week. And that wrecks the desert. Oh. So that was no good for us. So we had to go and find somewhere else. Gosh, and, 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 and that somewhere else turned out to be um, in South Africa. Was it somewhere that... Haxkin Barn, yeah. yeah. Was, was that somewhere which you'd, you'd known about for a while, or was it only... Well, after... we did, actually. It was just sort of on, vaguely on the on our horizon, uh, because my brother Andrew had been looking at different sites for us around the world with Thrust 2, and he'd been to Haxkin Barn, and he said it's, it's, it's just a wonderful place, but unfortunately there's a road going right across the middle, and... Uh, Obviously, in the first two days, we, we really didn't think we got the credibility to, to get the road moved. Um, but, of course, with, with Bloodhound, um, yes, we did. And the help from the Northern Cape government was just absolutely outstanding. And they put a, a thousand man years of work into preparing the course. Wow. It was just unbelievable. And uh, everything had to be done more or less by hand. So they had 300 people working. And they picked up um, some 16,000 tons of stones by hand. It's a simply fantastic achievement. So we ended up with um, what I think is the best course in the world. Nobody's got anything like this. No, I'm sure. But I mean, but for you, Richard, I mean, um, you, um, you you left the project after the car had run down at 
at Newquay. Um, it had been, as you say, 11 years of, of war. And I'm just wondering what that feeling was like for you. Was it, was it a bit of disappointment or, or, or had you sort of ha had your fill of it by then? We're going through a really interesting time. Um, I'd just like to say something about the Bloodhound education because this was uh, an achievement. Basically what had happened, this was racing and Paul was in the defense equipment and support. We were trying to get support us with the Eurofighter engines. And he explained the one thing they wanted in the Royal Air Force on the was um, better on improvement schools. In other words, they were finding it very, very difficult to hire scientists and engineers. And uh, Paul remembered that, uh, that basically British projects like, for instance, the Concorde, the Vulcan, the Lightning, TSR2, all these really inspired the kids big, big time. And that resulted in a large supply of scientists and engineers. So his idea was that we should, um, um, we should run the project through the schools. And um, uh, I figured that there was some sort of a deal to be had there. And so um, we set up the education team, which became enormous. And we were, um, Bloodhound was going through um, about 129,000 school uh, kid, kids' engagements per annum. Wow. Absolutely enormous. Yeah. Very, very powerful. And the kids, of course, who today just live on their screens, they don't have reality. And I like to think that anything on the screen is being faked anyhow. Um, you know, <laughs> when, when we saw them at Newquay, we had, um, I don't know, we had 3,000 kids there, I think it was. And um, when they saw the car running, they were just absolutely mind blown. It was terrific. It was really working well. Now, the problem really lay with the money. The money was always going to be more difficult than the rest of the project. And, and, I, I, um, and was that because, um, did you have, have people saying to you, well, you've already broken the sound barrier, you know, you're breaking a record that you already got? I mean, presumably if um, Fawcett had gone and broken your record, it would have been rather easier to find the funds. I don't know about that, Andrew, but certainly it would seem to, to have been, yes, yeah. Uh, and we decided that what we would do is we would carry on because we've got a really brilliant project and uh, we needed to do that. And um, the money was very, very difficult. And we some of these big deals took five and six years to do. That gives you some sort of idea of the problems and hassles you've got. And all the time you're trying to maintain the process, you're trying to maintain the cash flow. And there were uh, awful times when, um, uh, you know, we simply had no money. But the team's teamwork was fantastic and people just kept going um, because, you know, we knew we could do it. We knew this thing was really valuable. And, of course, it was going to be of huge value to the country in due course once, um, once we completed. And, um, but our fundamental weakness was that we couldn't bring the big deals in in batches of two. That's what we really wanted to do. So that uh, sponsor A comes on board and makes its payment, first payment. Sponsor B comes on board and makes its first payment. Sponsor A then makes its second payment. Yeah. That's what people would ideally like to do. But yes. we just could not do that, however hard we tried. And um, then it really did look as if we were going to get for the record in 2017. Uh, it was a really exciting time. Um, what happened in 2016 is we put the car on display uh, no, in 2015, we put the car on display in London and 8,000 people came to see it. But we made a tactical error because we put the car on display on its wheels. First time it had been seen on its wheels. And that, of course, the message to everybody is the next time, the next um, stage of this project is the car's going to run. Yeah. And that represented danger and represented risk. Up until that point, the, the project had been developing around about £1.5 billion pounds worth of publicity um, with virtually no risk because all the car was in this, during the early stage of the project was a pile of parts that wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. But now we were moving to the risk area. And um, as soon as we put the car on display like that, all the sponsorship, everything just collapsed. So I went to George Osborne, who was then the Chancellor, and said, George, look, we've got a real problem here. Um, we need help because I can't keep the cash flow up. I can't keep it going. And he set up an enormous program with uh, the government, with Bayes, or Biz or Bayes. Or, and um, they got, um, and he said, he instructed to uh, establish the value for Britain. And uh, at the same time, although we didn't know the time, 
uh, a Spanish character, Lee Shufu, who was the uh, chief executive, or sorry, the chairman of the GD Car Company, um, had opened up the London uh, Electric Vehicle Company in um, in Coventry with um, David Cameron and, and Osborne, and he had um, off. Uh, sorry, the politicians had uh, gone back to London, and he went to a car museum. Uh, thrust two and thrust as a C, and he decided then and there that's what he wanted to do. So we had a huge battle to try and uh, try and get that the Geely Car Company deal through, and we did it. And it was a terrific achievement. It really was, and I love working with the Chinese. So it was, it was such fun. It was so, yeah, so it was so demanding. It was so intellectual. It was just brilliant. Uh, then the government then um, came forward with its deal. That was a letter from Joe Johnson with an offer, which was great. And we went to, and uh, the Chinese then made their first payment, which is terrific. And then we had the uh, the meeting with the um, the Bayes people, and we couldn't interpret the meeting. We'd met all their conditions. We couldn't make, interpret their meeting. And, it, and after a well, after bit, it became quite clear that they were just not going to pay. And that, of course, wrecked our cash flow. And... Um, and it also, um, you know, the Chinese were very honourable about the whole thing because, of course, they'd now lost money on it, but they weren't going to spend any more. And I suppose they probably thought that, um, you know, if uh, um, the British government isn't going to support this thing, then why should the Chinese? So, you know, and that's a totally understandable position. Yes. So gradually, we then ran the car, and we got the car running, which was a new key, and... Then, um, then basically, um, we, it took 18 months to turn the government around. And the Secretary of State then, um, uh, Craig Clark, then basically um, corrected the, uh, the Bayes mistake and made it legal. But he wasn't going to give us, give us any money unless we found even more money. And by that time, of course, uh, Brexit was, it was uh, taking, taking up all the money everywhere. And there was just no more money. So that was it. We just had to put it into administration. It was over. Gosh. Gosh. And, and how, did, I mean, did, how did that feel to you? Was it, it must have been a crushing disappointment. Yeah. Um, to tell the truth, um, we were all absolutely exhausted. I mean, I was, didn't realise how ill I was. I was absolutely shattered. And, um, you know, because you're fighting every day. It's exactly as Connor said. You're fighting a war every day, battle after battle after battle, problem after problem. And um, uh, and it was taking a, t- a tremendous toll on us, really. And so when Ian Warhurst, who bought uh, the project, decided... Uh, uh, he and I had our first meeting, and he said he didn't want me on the project. So I said that was absolutely fine, because I just needed a rest. Uh, and um, it took me about three months to recover. Gosh. And and now that they have... We're, we're going to have to wrap this up shortly because I'm taking up a, yeah. lot, a lot of your time. But, but but now that they have been down there and now that they've got above 600 miles an hour on the jet alone without using the rocket, uh, I mean, obviously, this um, this awful virus isn't, isn't helping anybody's cash flow at the moment. But w- w- what do you think are, are their chances of actually getting back there um, next year or the year after and... Um, and well, it's, at least breaking the last speed record. It's Britain and money. That's what it's all about. Britain and money. Basically, we've got a good car there. There's a lot of work that's gone into it. Everybody's uh, very conf- confident with it. Um, it's just a matter now of um, getting the committing to on to the rocket motor with Namo, uh, our um, Norwegian rocket manufacturer. They're all very excited about it and very, very committed. Um, they're very keen to do it. Um, but uh, they need paying, and um, and basically um, Ian's got to raise the money. That's what's got to happen. Yeah. Um, and then um, and then it should be possible. Of course, as you always know, with a land speed record project, you're doing something that's never been done before. Um, uh, you know, and there may be all sorts of things that make make this thing absolutely impossible. But we don't know of them now. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, th- Richard, thank you so much. Uh, I, th- I think probably the final question is: um, uh, you, you don't strike me as being a man who's very good at sitting still. So, um, so, so what? <laughs> so, 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 what next? A- a- any other little projects on the go at the moment? Well, we're looking at the water speed record at the moment. Um, it's just a very, very early days. Wow. Um, what happened was that um, in 1952, I saw John Cobb's jet boat Crusader on Loch Ness, um, and that really is, is inspired all this. 
And um, unfortunately, a few days later, it broke up and killed Cobb. Um, and Reed Railton, the great designer, um, had, uh, um, was so upset over this that he went back to California and he designed another boat. But, um, he couldn't get it built because by that time there was only one source of money. And now they've gone to Donald Campbell. So Campbell was pushing on with the, the, the very, very successful K-7 boat. Yes. And um, Railton had come up with something which was completely and utterly different. And I was very keen to uh, to see what it was like and what it was going. And um, basically, um, we managed to get hold of uh, uh, of one of Railton's models. And from his model, um, we've built um, a couple of jet-powered models. And we're going to see if it works. But we're all locked down at the moment, so we can't do anything. Gosh, well, uh, Richard, I wish you all the very best, but best of luck with, with that and everything else you, 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 you may go on to do. Um, thank you so much for spending your time to talk to Drive Nation. People listening to this, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to rate, review and subscribe uh, wherever you can. It'll help us to do some more. But in the meantime, Richard Noble, OBE, thank you so much for your time. It really has been a fascinating hour uh, and I couldn't be more grateful to you. Thank you so much. Please the book. Yeah, absolutely. Buy the book. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. All Bye. the best. Bye-bye.